my gentle and of course very modern apes, I don't have a clever segue to push us into today's topic. I'm just gonna hit you with the brute fact of it. We're gonna be talking about the most painful debate I think I've ever seen. To be perfectly honest, calling it a debate is being very loose with that term. I think I'm more comfortable calling this a discussion. If one were to characterize it honestly, we would simply call it an embarrassment. I realize that's harsh. I've actually been debating on making this video for quite some time now. I've been chewing on it after listening to it at the gym and go to the gym last week. And I feel as though the reason I felt trepidation when it comes to actually putting my thoughts on video and going through this piece by piece is I feel that this is going to be a very difficult video to make while still being respectful. And I feel like by pointing that out, I'm already being kind of mean, but you're going to see what I'm talking about as we work through this discussion. I feel as though on this channel, I try to keep from being unnecessarily mean. That is to say, I try to only be sassy mode when I've been struck first. I've, I'm a retaliatory sass master. And I've never been personally slighted by the interlocutor we're going to be primarily discussing today. So I'm going to do my absolute best to keep my jokes and fun poking at arguments only. And there we will be ruthless. Enough foreplay. It's time to discuss the discussion between King Crocoduck and Professor David McQueen, which was held over on Modern Day Debate on the legitimacy of radiometric dating. You're gonna wanna have the aspirin ready for this one. of radiometric dating, in favor of a globe Earth, we have King Crocoduck. If you've been around YouTube for a while, you probably know King Crocoduck. He's something of a legend when it comes to the early YouTube days of creation versus evolution conversations. His debate with Kent Hovind on astronomy and young Earth creationism is like a classic. You should go view it if you haven't already and really just check out KC's stuff in general. Formally, he is a biomedical physicist, so he's got quite a bit of background when it comes to understanding radiometric dating, which includes quite a bit of physics, now doesn't it? You know David McQueen already. Tube. If you've been around this channel for a while, but for those of you who may not be in the loop here, David McQueen has a master's in geology, and he's been pushing the young earth creationist ideas for a long time. For those of you who may not know, young earth creationists are evangelical Christians who believe that the earth was created more or less in its present day form 6,000 years ago, and that the entire geologic column is effectively the result of Noah's flood from Noah's Ark. Today, David McQueen spends a lot of time bopping around the YouTube channel Monkey for Banana, a young earth creationist ministry channel, where he still basically pushes the same ideas that he's pushed for the past several decades. Obviously, he is arguing in this debate that radiometric dating does not work at all and cannot be trusted because radiometric dating is like a massive issue for young Earth creationists, given it consistently tells us that the Earth is billions of years old, not 6,000. So just hearing that, 
This is a really good matchup for this kind of conversation, right? On one hand, King Crocoduck has the physics background to talk about radiometric dating and the processes behind it and why he thinks it should be trusted, and David McQueen has the background in geology, so presumably should be able to tell us something about why he supposes it doesn't work with rocks or something along those lines. Now again, this is not an actual debate, right? This is a fun internet conversation and has zero bearing on the actual scientific consensus where radiometric dating is hailed as a massively useful tool that proves itself again and again and again to be accurate. Now we talk about the accuracy of radiometric dating all the time on this channel, and one of my favorite things to point out is the fact that radiometric dating is used in the process of basin modeling, the very first step of fossil fuel discovery. So we've got a hundred billion dollar industry annually that is built upon the back of radiometric dating being accurate to actually pull fossil fuels up out of the ground. One of my geology friend has provided me with several different citations to actually support this notion, like the actual literature behind fossil fuel discovery. This has been pointed out to David McQueen several times, and he has never once actually read through these citations in any kind of meaningful way and shown us why the people publishing this massive success and corroboration of radiometric dating are wrong, actually. In the past, McQueen has shrugged off the support for radiometric dating in the fossil fuel industry by simply saying, well, you can find fossil fuels without actually using basin modeling. And like, you can hit a bullseye on a dartboard with your eyes closed too, but you're going to do so at a much less frequent rate, like on an order of magnitude, than with your eyes open. The same is true with radiometric dating and fossil fuel discovery. When you use it in basin modeling, you are overwhelmingly more successful in actually finding fossil fuels like oil and gas than if you just willy-nilly stick a probe down into the crust of the earth. Like, to be abundantly clear, radiometric dating should not be able to accurately predict the location of fossil fuels if the Earth is 6,000 years old. This should not work, full stop, and yet it does. So McQueen saying, well, you don't need it, has absolutely no bearing on that and does not serve as any kind of argument against it. And in this debate, we actually find out the real reason why McQueen thinks radiometric dating doesn't work. If you just thought to yourself, huh, that's kind of ominous. That's a good instinct to have. All right, we're seven minutes in. It's time to get started. Let's view this debate and begin with the intros. Tonight, we are joined by King Crocoduck and he is facing David McQueen. And we are also joined by Donnie of Standing for Truth Ministries. Great technical debate so far. I appreciate the work you both put into this. So let's keep this uh, cordial, on topic, and as I like to say, sophisticated. We got Donnie Deals in the flesh, baby. To fill those of you who may not know in, David McQueen regularly goes on Donnie's YouTube channel. Professor McQueen being our uh, team geologist and flood researcher. They are both young earth creationists. Now I think Donnie does a fine job as a moderator here. He kind of just sits back and lets the conversation flow. But it is worth noting that the two of them are indeed friends and it would not surprise me at all if Donnie helped David McQueen prepare for this debate. I suspect eventually, as is a classic Donnie Deal style video, that we will get like a four or five hour response stream on his own channel trying to debunk King Crocodile here. Because as you will see, uh, Donnie's horse does not do so well in this race. We're gonna begin with King Crocoduck's opener. I'm not gonna show the whole thing, just the parts that I thought were exceptionally good, which is difficult to do because the whole intro is just an absolute banger. So my argument for the reliability of radiometric dating rests upon three points. Um, first, the fact that decay rates are derivable from fundamental physics. Second, that results are independently reproduced via a plurality of dating techniques across a wide range of space and time. And third, the fact that anomalous results are so sparse relative to the volume of consistent results that even if we couldn't explain the anomalies, we'd still be justified in using radiometric dating. This is an awesome start by KC. He lays out precisely the points that he's going to make in a clear, organized fashion so that you, the viewer, can follow along with ease. The points are also very simple, which they did not have to be considering physics is KC's background. 
Number one, he notes that decay rates come from fundamental laws and physics. Number two, he notes that these dates are often corroborated by numerous other independent means. And number three, he points out that when there are anomalies, they are almost always explainable. And when they aren't, this still does not dampen the sort of usefulness of radiometric dating and how robust it truly is. And it is this last point that he goes into later in a truly eloquent way. Casey first elaborates on point one, where he discusses the history of the relationship behind quantum mechanics and radioactive decay, along with the ideas that govern them. Now, the ability for radioactive decay rates to be accurately predicted by quantum physics is important, because before anyone even enters a laboratory to empirically measure decay rates, it's already possible to know what the decay rate for a particular radioisotope is going to be just by knowing certain things about that isotope, like its atomic number and fundamental constants like the charge of electrons. Now, I've always been really proud of the heat problem that I've tried to popularize as an argument against young Earth creationism. Essentially, they need to make sense of the radiometric dates that we have and basically cram billions of years worth of decay into 6,000 years by proposing accelerated nuclear decay, which results in enough heat released in the single year of Noah's flood, or 6,000 years as a maximum, to vaporize the granitic crust of the Earth several times over. And I've liked this as an explanation because it means that they have to come up with some kind of way physically to make their accelerated nuclear decay work without breaking the laws of physics. But what KC has done here, frankly, blows my argument out of the water. Because really what he's saying is if you accept the basic laws of physics, you necessarily have to accept radiometric dating, unless you're going to reconfigure physics in such a way that it explains all our current observations without validating radioactive decay laws that are the foundation of radiometric dating. And he formalizes this in a question. So here's my first challenge to creationists. If radiometric dating is unreliable, then why are we able to calculate the decay rates of radioisotopes from first principles in fundamental physics? The same physics that makes predictions that have been validated to 10 decimal places, the same physics that's responsible for the existence of digital technology, and thus the world we live in today, is the exact same physics that tells us that when the building blocks of nature are organized into atoms with such and such properties, they're going to take such and such amount of time to decay. And then those predictions end up agreeing spectacularly with measurement, leading us to conclude that the Earth is billions of years old. My question is, why? <sighs> that sucks. This, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, woof. That's basically saying if you accept regular physics and indeed everything that regular physics uses from digital technology to like GPS and stuff like that, um, then you're going to have to accept radiometric dating unless you can reinvent physics in such a way that makes sense of all of those other things and excludes radiometric dating, which is not possible. Okay, moving on to point number two. Radiometric dating consists of a plurality of techniques across many different radioisotopes, all with unique parent-daughter ratios and decay rates. Published results consistently converge on the same conclusions using different methods over and over and over again. Uh, for example, the geologist uh, Gary Dalrymple made the table on the left, summarizing the results from research he led in 1993, when he sent tektite samples to different laboratories in Australia, Canada, France, and California. These facilities independently radiometrically dated the samples via a variety of techniques, including argon-argon, potassium-argon, rubidium-strontium, and uranium-lead. Uh, the results, as summarized by the table, clearly converge upon the same tight spread of values on the order of about 65 million years. This is another excellent point. It's one we bring up a lot on this channel where we talk about the nature of radiometric dating and how it is corroborated by other methods. What KC is focusing on specifically here is a publication that showed the cross corroborations of different types of radiometric dating specifically. So as you heard there, argon-argon dates converge on the same date range that you get from like uranium lead. This of course lends support to the fact that the laws of radioactive decay are internally consistent within the periodic table. 
The K happens in the same way, regardless of the parent to daughter elements that you use. This of course should not be the case if radiometric dating does not work or if the foundations of it are in fact flawed. And we'll see how McQueen actually addresses this later. What I would have liked to see here if I was KC is I would have had a throwaway line at this exact moment where I said, and not only is this within radiometric dating techniques, but it's also in techniques independent of radiometric dating, things like thermoluminescence dating, ice cores, dendrochronology, the freaking movements of the continents. That last one is a favorite of mine and I'm gonna take a minute to explain it because surprise, surprise, it comes up later. So here we can see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That's this little neon line that goes down in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Now what's going on here is two tectonic plates are moving apart from one another. And as they do, they expose magma that wells up to the surface along this ridge. When the magma is exposed to the seawater, it hardens and becomes new crust. This is called seafloor spreading because as the continents spread apart, seafloor is created along this line. Now, if radiometric dating is correct, then what we should see is as you move away from this mid-Atlantic ridge here, say at this spot, this spot, and this spot successively, we should find older dates as you move away from the ridge, as the ridge creates new continental crust. Now, the interesting thing about this is we can also clock the rate at which the tectonic plates are moving away from one another using GPS measurements. Right. Every time you take a GPS ping here on the west coast of Africa and the east coast of the United States, and you do that year after year after year, you'll get a rate of I believe it's 1.2 inches per year that the continents are moving apart from one another. So you can wind back the clock and you can compare the speed at which the continents are moving apart to the radiometric dates at given points away from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and you will find that they are in lockstep. What this means is that if God doesn't want radiometric dating to be accurate, he is being deceptive here because the rate at which the continents are moving independently confirms radiometric dating. This is of course silly, but I can appreciate that Casey is keeping it within his own wheelhouse and he's also trying to maintain a tight intro here. So moving on. These kinds of tables also exist for cross comparisons between radiometric dating and other techniques, including tree ring dating, ice core dating, and various types of luminescence dating. You get the picture. Ooh. All right, but he didn't mention the continental drift stuff. That, that, part, that part holds. So here's my second challenge to creationists. If radiometric dating is unreliable, then why do scientific publications consistently report the same results across different techniques, labs, and even decades? Here's a table published by Bouvier et al. Um, 15 years after Dalrymple's chondrite publication, where they dated a bunch of different chondrites from all around the globe, and their results still match Dalrymple's from the previous decade. They also got about four and a half billion. Why? Why are these results so consistent with each other? This is another thing that he points out that I really hope you appreciate, right? It's not radiometrically dating one sample using one method at one lab. It's dozens of different methods at dozens of different labs across thousands of different samples all converging on the Earth being indeed very ancient. And this is going to be critical for later. That's called foreshadowing. So uh, here comes my third and final challenge to creationists. And this one is a little bit more philosophical. So consider the image on the left. This is a mammographic image. It's an x-ray of a woman's breast. And I'm very sorry, modern day debates looks like you're going to be demonetized. Um, <laughs> According to a recent study from UC Davis, about half the women who get screened for breast cancer will, over the course of 10 years, get at least one false positive. This is one such example. So given this fact, is it reasonable to dismiss medical imaging as unreliable and stop giving people x-rays and MRIs? Uh, should we stop screening high-risk women for breast cancer? Should we stop sending trauma patients and confused old people who walk into the emergency room with half their faces sagging into CT scanners where they're going to have loads of radiation dumped into their bodies and possibly get suboptimal images that might potentially lead to misdiagnoses? And the answer, I think, is very obviously no. The occasional presence of anomalies is not a compelling reason to abandon a measurement technique, 
yeah, this is exactly the kind of silly reasoning creationists will routinely apply to radiometric dating. I think this is a super elegant example, especially compared to what I normally use. Typically, I talk about like antibiotics and some kind of bacterial infection and how if antibiotics were to work 98% of the time, you're going to say it works against that given bacterial infection, even though there is a chance, 2% chance that it's going to fail and how that 2% chance of failure is not going to give us cause to not use the antibiotics antibiotics or to say that they don't work. But the example that KC uses here is actually specific. Mine is much more nebulous. His is specific and has a study to back it up. And he is, of course, exceedingly correct here. We're not going to stop doing medical imaging because sometimes there are false positives. The creationist case against radiometric dating typically rests upon a laundry list of a dozen or so anomalies in which it's asserted that radiometric dating has failed. Now, those of us who have been debunking creationism for many years can pretend to be ignorant and naive. Casey then just goes off, giving example after example of young Earth creationists either being intentionally or accidentally incompetent when it comes to radiometric dating. We can pretend not to know that the living mollusk shells and the recently killed seals that Kent Hovind likes to point to have been subject to the reservoir effect. We can pretend not to know that the Velocevich mammoth that Eric Hovind likes to point to did not, as he claims, have two different parts of its body dated differently, but was in fact two entirely different mammoths. We can pretend to be ignorant of the Xenocrists contaminating Steve Austin's Mount St. Helens samples. We can pretend to be ignorant of the fact that Andrew Snelling's quote-unquote wood, pictured here, which was almost certainly an iron concretion, was porous from groundwater contamination. We can pretend to be ignorant of the memory artifacts that arise from the submission of inappropriate samples to places like Geochron Labs. And on and on and on and on. This man just loads up and starts taking out bad faith examples of radiometric dating like a Gatling gun. There are, of course, a zillion different examples of young Earth creationists inappropriately using radiometric dating. And as KC said, most of them are user error, right? So a lot of times they'll date brand new volcanic rock and then get mad when it doesn't give them the date of the volcanic eruption, which was like 10 years earlier. As I've mentioned many times on this channel, radiometric dating doesn't work like that. Um, not enough daughter has actually decayed from the parent to be measurable. The example I usually give is this would be like trying to get the weight of a semi truck by placing it on a microgram scale. It's just not the right tool for the job. And saying that the tool doesn't work because you are improperly using it would be like giving someone antibiotics when they have a viral infection and then when it does nothing, saying that antibiotics don't work. And like, this is not a hard concept to understand that you can't radiometrically date something that just happened. I can't imagine this isn't taught in like Geology 101 courses in undergrad, which begs the question, why are young Earth creationists improperly using radiometric dating? It's almost like they want the dates to be wrong so they can get the conclusion they want to hear. This is very interesting because, of course, when you allow decay to actually happen to the degree that you can actually pick up on daughter material, like, for instance, the Mount Vesuvius eruption, which happened a few thousand years ago instead of 10 years ago, you get pristine calendar dates and studies back this up. I always bring up, I think it's a 1998 study. And that's relevant too, because this gets brought up to McQueen later in the discussion. That's called foreshadowing. But even if we were naive and didn't know the reasons for these kinds of failures, with the presence of the dozen or so examples from the laundry list of anomalies that creationists have been peddling for the past 30 years, be sufficient to disqualify radiometric dating, given the literal thousands of independently reproduced results that have accumulated over the same period. And this is without even mentioning the fact that you'd need to revise fundamental physics to justify this kind of move. So that's my third challenge to the creationist. Please explain why you think a handful of anomalous results poses a serious challenge to the thousands of consistent results reported in the literature. Okay, so to recap, um, decay rates are derivable from our most predictively precise theories in fundamental physics. The results of radiometric dating are independently reproduced via a plurality of dating te techniques across a wide range of space and time. And the small handful of anomalies that creationists like to point to are so overwhelmingly outweighed by consistent results that even if we didn't have plausible explanations for these anomalies, we would still be justified in treating radiometric dating as being reliable. Okay, that's my opening statement. Mwah. 
excellent job. Casey's made it super easy for them to tackle these very straightforward questions without having to dig around. He offers his sources right there in his presentation. So if they have a leg to stand on, this should be quite easy indeed to uh, refute, now shouldn't it? Now let's hear McQueen's opening statement. From 1983 to 1987, I was a full-time flood geologist for the Institute for Creation Research in California. So yes, David McQueen is coming at this from a very unbiased place, having been a flood geologist working with creationism ministries for effectively his entire life. In fact, he goes on to say that he worked for Henry Morris. Henry Morris, the author of the Genesis Flood, the original text that rejuvenated the young earth creationism in the United States long after the Seventh-day Adventists had kind of fallen by the wayside. So this is very interesting, particularly given some of the things that McQueen is going to say later on about bias. Our choice tonight, King, is do we prefer ready dating or dating redheads? I appreciate your comments about mammography because over the 50 years of our marriage, I have been married to a redhead. Next. Okay, you guys, so like McQueen is an older guy. He makes a lot of grandpa jokes, and I think that's perfectly fine. I wasn't super pleased to see all of the jokes making fun of his age in the comments under this debate. I think that McQueen should be criticized on the basis of his argument, not on the basis of something he can't control. However, as much as I would love to completely parse and parcel out McQueen's arguments from the sort of grandpa-style antics, it's not really possible to do. It comes in a single package that is very difficult to dissect into arguments alone, although I will do my best in sort of trimming the fat, the random anecdotes here and there from this review. That being said, McQueen is an adult, so we are going to treat him as such and dissect and likely eviscerate his arguments systematically, making fun of them if they are bad, but not making fun of McQueen the person, and I sincerely hope that you will hold to that when you are commenting on this video. My atheist opponent, so he claims, doesn't understand the value of the three problems that affect all dating methods. So McQueen has pulled a classic wood morap here and has decided to invoke these assumptions that he thinks are being made by radiometric dating. And they are assumptions, I would say, but they are justified assumptions. The first he proposes is unknown original conditions. So this would be, he's saying, we assume known original conditions when the conditions are actually unknown. The second is leaching and deposition. I'm pretty sure where he's going with this is when there are discordant dates, there are alternative explanations for why the dates might be discordant, as KC went over earlier, and he thinks that this is assumed instead of just accepting that we'll never know. And the third is he proposes a constant decay rate is assumed, and he's proposing that the assumptions here are without justification, or at least not without sufficient justification. So that first one, let's touch on that first. Unknown initial conditions. How do we know that when rocks form, which we're usually radiometrically dating rocks, igneous rocks to be precise, when they form, how do we know that they're all parent? And the answer is we've never seen them form and them not be all parent because we see igneous rocks form each and every day because we have active volcanic sites all across the world. And when these rocks form, they are indeed all parent. So if McQueen and any other young earth creationist wants to show that an igneous rock can form with anything other than all parent material and no daughter material, well all they have to do is show that that can happen. And gee willikers, wouldn't this have been a great spot for McQueen to slip a source that supports that in? Why didn't he do it? The only even potential exception to this rule is when rocks partially form before they're actually erupted out of a volcano. So they kind of form in this mantle area right underneath the volcano. They partially harden and then they are erupted and then they finish fully forming. And even then the number of daughter material, the amount of daughter material is going to be astonishingly low. So to be abundantly clear, they're asking for us to consider the possibility that there might be an exception to a rule for which there are no current exceptions. Then he moves on to his second point where he proposes this idea that 
leaching or intrusions into the system can actually give incorrect dates. Never mind the fact that this would have to happen in such a way, this leaching would have to happen in such a way in every single instance of radiometric dating in different ways to just make it appear as though they corroborate with one another. Like the leaching itself would have to be in lockstep, which would again, seemingly to me, make God very deceptive. But he backs up his point by citing this guy, Vernon Cups from 2019, another young Earth creationist who says the following. Excellent book I'd recommend to you, King, is by Vernon Cups. came out in 2019. He uses a different argument. He calls it closed system assumption. And notice what he says. So critical to all radiometric dating methods is this closed system assumption. And notice the comment. It strains credibility when applied over millions of years. Now, why would that be? Next. So a closed system is actually assessed prior to radiometric dating because you're not going to believe this, you guys, but there's actually diagnostic characteristics that show up when a system has become open, when it's been intruded by other minerals or groundwater or what have you that could potentially skew the radiometric dating method. Boo, guts a gibbon, you're just saying that leaching is evident through diagnostic characteristics as a rescuing device. Oh, my friend, take it up with McQueen. You see the brown color king? That's uh, either leaching or hydrothermal additions. And so as I have gone in the field since the early 70s, I've routinely seen as an economic geologist this kind of alteration. It's either by leaching or, as you see, close to the large white area in the middle, by hydrothermal additions. Next. So yes, it seems as though McQueen has just informed us that if leaching or hydrothermal additions have occurred or are present, then we can't trust radiometric dating. And then he proceeds to show us how we can tell when leaching or hydrothermal additions have happened. Thus, we know when we cannot trust radiometric dating. Now, I don't know if McQueen is aware of this, I don't know if he's indulged in enough of the literature, but there are rigorous parameters that have to be met before radiometric dating actually takes place on a sample, including making sure that the system was closed by looking for things that are clearly visible to the naked eye, like what he just showed on the screen. McQueen proceeds to talk about polonium halos and cross-contamination which don't really have anything to do with this third point being that decay rates are assumed to be constant. You know, the implication being that they should perhaps not be presumed to be constant. And then he boots it back to Casey. How would you answer that, King? Some quick background for the stuff that I skipped over. Polonium halos are an argument used by young earth creationists that was popularized by Robert Gentry back in the 1970s. Essentially, the argument works like this. Okay, so you've got granite, right? Type of granite that you're thinking of in your head. Granite as a rock takes millions of years to form. And within granite, we have this thing called biotite. Biotite is basically a group of different phyllosilicate minerals. And these phyllosilicate minerals that make up the biotite group fit into a larger group called the mica group. You basically just need to know that biotite nestles within mica, which is found in granite. Now, within biotite, you can often find radio halos. Radio halos are formed basically due to the decay of a radioactive element within the biotite. And there are lots of different types of radio halos. The cool thing about geology and about physics is you can look at the diameter of these halos within the biotite and you can determine which type of radioactive element formed that radio halo. Gentry's argument is thus. Polonium halos are formed due to the radioactive decay of polonium. A lot of these polonium isotopes indeed have short half-lives, like on the order of three minutes or something like that. So the argument goes from Gentry, since granite takes millions of years to form, the polonium half-life is simply too short for the rock to have formed via evolutionary timescales. All the polonium should have decayed away by the time the rock actually cooled to its final form. And thus, so the argument goes, the rock must have been created instantaneously instead of by conventional means. And that's what Gentry thinks happened, right? He thinks that these polonium halo-laden 
granites were created on day three of the creation week, right? Like snapped into existence along with everything else on its respective day. So what's the problem with this from a conventional science perspective? Because obviously this observation was made back in the 1970s and we've progressed just a touch since then. So David McQueen notes that Robert Gentry got his samples from all across the world. But curiously, when you look into this a little bit, you'll find that specific locations are only given from the work that he did in Canada. Specifically, he got samples from the Fission Mine, the Faraday Mine, and the Silver Crater Mine. So scientists other than Gentry could at least double check those sites and check they did. In 1988, J. Richard Wakefield went ahead and surveyed the sites that Gentry had gotten his samples from, and what he found was very interesting. One, he found sedimentary rock, which should not be the case. Sedimentary rock is, of course, laid down. This Precambrian granite was supposed to be poofed into existence on day three of the creation week. So sedimentary rock should not be found underneath, particularly since it doesn't seem to have evidence of reworking. Number two, and this is the more titillating of the two finds, there were microscopic fossils, stromatolites, underneath the Precambrian granite that Gentry supposes was again snapped into existence on day three creation week. This is interesting because, well, you've got two options. Either it wasn't made on creation week or number two, God just created rock with fossils already in it. Not only that, but the polonium halos are also almost always found along cracks in the rock. Wakefield was busy while our boy Brawley was at work, and in 1998, he released work that noted that in the case of the silver crater and fission locations, we weren't dealing with granite at all. Gentry's sample came from a calcite dike. In the case of the Faraday mine, we weren't even dealing with true granite, but granite pegmatite. What this means is that all the locations that were publicly available for scientists to cross-check that Gentry presented initially were actually not true granites, but a part of a vastly complicated geologic history that doesn't match his prediction. Brawley made a final note as well on his comparison between the resulting polonium from radon and polonium coming from a prior polonium isotope. And he noted that you can magnify up to 1000 times and you still cannot diagnostically tell the difference between known radon polonium decay products and known polonium polonium decay products. So then Gentry's samples are sketchy. The locations were poorly characterized by him and had to be investigated by other scientists to even understand the actual geologic background of these sites, which makes sense because Gentry is not actually a geologist. And then add on top of that, that these polonium halos are more likely based off of the characteristics of the surrounding rock, the results of decay from uranium and then radon, not from polonium. McQueen is gonna have more to add to this and we will cross that bridge when we come to it because I'm raring and ready to go. Let's let King Crocodile continue now that we've at least put a rudimentary explanation on the table for polonium halos. First, Casey talks about how he didn't really talk about cross-contamination. Okay, well, thank you, David McQueen, for uh, your opening statement. Uh, I just want to uh, correct a potential misunderstanding. I don't believe I mentioned cross-contamination when I discovered uh, Gamma's derivation. Then he talks briefly about how we know the general starting ratios using uranium and lead as an example. Um, how can we know the initial amounts of uranium? Um, so David brought up the question of, you know, if we don't know the, the original, how do we know the original conditions that lead to radioactive decay? Well, um, first of all, the raw, num the raw amounts of parent and daughter elements, um, those aren't quite as important as the ratios. Um, so, you know, whatever amount of initial parent material there is over a given volume, that's, that's really neither here nor there. Um, it's, it's the ratio of that to the daughter element. And in the case of something like a zircon crystal, uh, where you are looking at the ratio of uranium to lead, um, the, the zircon, it, it, it's not possible um, for, during the formation of these crystals for lead to be introduced into the structure. Um, so you can be reasonably certain that, that whatever lead you end up finding there, um, that's, that's, that's the product of uranium decaying into lead, uh, not the result of lead subsequently contaminating or, or lead somehow working its way into the crystal. You, 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 the, 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 the structure... Uh, of the crystal, it, it can't form with lead already in it. Uh, the condensed matter physics just don't allow it. And finally, to my absolute delight, he talks about some of the consequences of accelerating nuclear decay, but instead of moving into the realm of the heat problem, he takes it in his own direction. 
Okay, well, I guess I guess it's worthwhile to talk a little bit about some of the consequences of accelerating decay rates to the extent necessary um, to produce uh, to produce the results that are conciliant with the creationist account, and that is that you're going to end up sterilizing the entire Earth with the amount of radiation that you're producing. Um, you're taking uh, 4.6 billion years of geological history and compressing it into 6,000 years. Um, so you're going to have this outflux of lethal ionizing radiation that's going to irradiate everything on the planet and just kill it. Um, you, you get these kinds of silly results uh, when you start messing around with the laws of physics and you start messing around with this or that fundamental constant. I mean, you, you know, not even looking at the physics of it, not even looking at Gamow's equation, like, like let's say you wanted to change the charge of the electron to make this process feasible, right? Um, so you change the charge of the electron vastly to whatever hundreds of thousands of, um, of orders of magnitude necessary to produce the creationist answer. And now you end up with a situation where stable atomic nuclei can no longer form. McQueen responds to this correct characterization of his young Earth creationist outlook, wherein accelerating nuclear decay to the degree that you take 4.6 to 4.8 billion years of history and cram it into 6,000 years, where you're effectively unmitting the laws of physics in order to make that happen. And he responds by holding up a piece of paper that says, silly? Seriously, just, just watch what he does here. Um. The structure of the universe literally just 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 becomes kaput. Like, sir, we know it's silly. That's why Casey is pointing it out to you. Casey is just sitting here pointing at young Earth creationism and going, "This you," and then McQueen is getting offended. So, depending on how you approach this problem, whether you decide to tinker with fundamental constants or whether you decide to uh, just make it decay faster, and then you have this outflux of lethal ionizing radiation that sterilizes everything on the planet, it doesn't seem to me that anything fruitful comes of it. It seems to me that the most parsimonious explanation for these things um, is just the known physics, and we don't have to invent any new physics to explain this. Okay, so I think uh, I'll see the remainder of my time. I like the radiation problem. I think it's fun, although I am still partial to the heat problem. No matter how you spin it, cramming nuclear decay that spans across 4.5 to 4.8 billion years, 4.6 to 4.8 billion years, and putting that into a 6,000 year time frame, really a one year time frame if you're a young earth creationist, because they typically propose that all the wacky physics changes happen during the year of Noah's flood, you're going to have issues. Whether you're irradiating the planet and sterilizing everything, changing the laws of physics so you don't sterilize everything, and then unknitting reality by accident, or speeding it up to the extent that all the heat that is supposed to be spread across that vast span of time is now in a single year, and thus you vaporize the granitic crust of the Earth a dozen times over, there are issues that cannot be fixed, but not according to McQueen. You see, I have it on good authority, and this good authority is that McQueen has told me, that him and his buddy George, a random Australian friend of his, are working on fixing the math so that it works. Now, just so you guys know out there, they're trying to change physics here because Answers in Genesis, Institute for Creation Research, all these big orgs recognize that this is a problem that they're probably going to have to appeal to miracles to fix. There was an entire organization called the Rate Project made exclusively up of young earth creationist PhDs, geologists and physicists and stuff like that, who tried to figure this out back in the early 2000s. And they came to the conclusion that they would have to appeal to future exotic solutions to solve it because there is no way to speed up the decay and not ruin everything. McQueen has a solution though. Him and George have cooked something up and he calls it his blob model. Tube, which illustrates heat coming up from the B-L-O-B, the blob. McQueen likes his props. Uh, George and I uh, will continue to work all during the month of November on the mathematics of this. This was last November, you guys, not this November. It's been a year and we still have no math. Back in the present day, this is the part of the discussion where McQueen starts to get a little bit sassy. As a professional scientist, I don't appreciate you referring to what I think as being silly. Oh, boo hoo. Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. And especially what Dr. Baumgartner and Dr. Andrew Stelling, two colleagues of mine for many years, to characterize their 
information is silly. Yeah, I don't care. You should try not holding such a silly position. This is this is like that scene in Arrested Development where Job in the Alliance of Magicians hold a protest where they hold up a sign that says, we demand to be taken seriously. <laughs> oh, you don't want to be called silly? Then stop acting so silly. And if you think the silly meter is high now, just you wait. We're about to reach whole new levels of silliness. What, you think it can't get sillier? You think this can't get any more goofy? You think we've reached the highest level of wackiness? You don't know shit. So, where to begin with the mistakes you've made? Well, let's start. Let's start with uh, Polonium. He's really upset about being called silly. What a silly goose. The argument that Gentry put forward, and that I think, after my thirty years of study of this, as the years have gone on. Uh, is a point very well taken. Some of these polonium isotopes have very short half-lives, as a matter of fact, less than three minutes. So we've already gone over the basics behind the polonium halo stuff, but next McQueen is going to bring up a concept called eutectic crystallization. Let's hear him out. Now, I appreciate King's comments about not being a geologist, so he may not know about a uh, process that uh, is called eutectic crystallization. Eutectic crystallization on a phase diagram. At the University of Michigan, I had to suffer through a semester of physical chemistry. It was so bad at Michigan, so hard, that there were bumper stickers that said, honk if you pass PCHEM. I mean, for what it's worth, my undergraduate degree was entirely STEM. I was pre-vet at the time. So I took two semesters of inorganic chem, two semesters of organic chem, one semester of biochem, and two semesters of physics alongside all the biology courses. And I feel like phase diagrams were not the difficult portion of inorganic chemistry. So sadly, I actually do know what I'm talking about about this. It was very, very difficult uh, uh, class. But... On a phase diagram, this point here is called the eutectic. Now, what does that mean? The eutectic means that a mineral like biotite or a mineral like fluorite, two of the minerals that radioactive halos are found in, when you reach that eutectic point of pressure and temperature, they immediately crystallize. And so there's nothing uh, magical about the rapid crystallization of things like polonium-210. So there being a name for the rapid crystallization of polonium, that being the eutectic point, does not mean that the conditions to reach the eutectic point of polonium in this granite system do not in and of themselves have to be magical, right? If God creates everything ex nihilo on day three, that's magical, even if a eutectic point is involved. If I point at someone and tell them to spontaneously combust, and then they do, the magic element is me telling them to spontaneously combust. The act of spontaneous combustion itself can be quantified in like physical and chemical means. That doesn't mean it can happen naturally. But, now let's not miss the, the point. Uh, as Gentry wrote his... Uh, papers for nature and science. These were peer-reviewed peer papers. You know, he went he went back to his background as a Seventh-day Adventist, and he looked back, and when, when Genesis records that uh, God created the heavens and the earth, and then on the third day there were uh, additional rocks formed, he viewed that as happening very quickly. And on the third day, God said, let the basement granite reach a eutectic point, right? Like, that's, that's still magic, guys. It's, it's still magic. Then McQueen goes on to say some, like, super off-topic and, like, wildly inappropriate stuff with regard to the conversation at hand. And there is no segue for this. This next clip comes immediately after the last clip of McQueen ended. So just so you can appreciate how out of left field this is. So from my viewpoint as a Christian, 
king's name should be spelled lowercase k i n g as an atheist he views he, he views himself as being king of a certain domain i guess you would say um but he's not the true king of the universe capital k i n g and that's the king lord jesus he's the one that uh, created everything okay do you think the queen took issue with kings and queens on earth who are a part of monarchies referring to themselves as kings and queens like is it just kc that's irritating him here or is he just an anti-monarchist as a whole but then it's right back to gentry like seamless transition it's it's very odd and so gentry would put in his papers uh, comments like, um, what was the word he liked to use? He would use the word providence as a substitute for God, I guess. And um, he would talk about changing the paradigm of nuclear physics. Very, very important point. How? How is that a very important point? How is the fact that Gentry used veiled language for his religious beliefs an important point with regard to the reliability and legitimacy of radiometric dating. David? I don't know, seems kind of silly. So next, McQueen goes on to talk about radiometric dating as a process and how he himself has never done it and how few radiometric dating labs there truly are out there. What could be lurking beneath the surface? Um, it is true, and I acknowledge I've never actually done it. Why? There are probably only 15 labs in all of America and another 30 labs worldwide that do, that do radiometric dating. Oh, how interesting. Only 15 in the United States, huh? And then maybe another 30 worldwide. Boy, wouldn't it be convenient if there was some kind of list out there for something like that? Sir, I gotta tell you, I'm getting real sick and tired of hearing creationists say stuff and then finding out they're wrong on the first result of a given Google search. But McQueen needs the number to be low, actually. He has a point that he's about to make. You've probably already guessed what it is. So there, it's a, it's a very closed circle. It's like a, uh, it's like a cult. It's like uh, the Masonic order or the uh the illuminati or something like that oh no <laughs> you're an adult oh, no, no. hey it's a conspiracy baby the illuminati the freemasons all working together to hold together the new world order by radiometrically dating rocks Thousands of workers across 150 labs worldwide, all in on it. I mean, you got to give it to them, right? There are very few young Earth creationists that will just come right out and say, yeah, I guess it does look too much like the Earth is very ancient. It must be a conspiracy. Why are the elites hiding the fact that the globe Earth is actually flat? Because of sinister reasons. Why are the <laughs> Illuminati hiding the fact that the Earth is very young because of sinister reasons. You know, every month when I get their newsletter, I encourage the higher ups that we need to come up with a better motivation than just sinister reasons, but they tell me that's not my department. Are the people, again, they're, they're probably less than 200 people 
that actually understand how you take a granite and uh, use hydrochloric acid, begin to dissolve everything out. And then notice the words that King used, lowercase king. Um, he said that Dalrymple chose from those hydrochloric acid etched zircons the ones he thought would be best. So one, of course, it's not going to be 200 people in the whole world that know how to radiometrically date stuff when we have 150 labs, right? Not to mention the fact that the process is taught to students who then don't go on to actually work in radiometric dating labs. So we're talking thousands of individuals, probably certainly over a thousand, probably well more than that. With regard to Dalrymple's sampling, yes, it turns out he would decide which samples to use. If you find a sample that is clearly contaminated by like groundwater or something, it wouldn't make sense to use it. It's going to give inaccurate results. In any field where you take samples of things, you choose the samples that are going to yield results and not be corrupted by other variables. Ooh, you might be thinking, how do you know that picking those specific samples isn't leading to some kind of bias and we only think radiometric dating works because we're picking the samples where it works. One, that's silly for numerous different methodological reasons, but two, if that were the case, radiometric dating wouldn't be capable of making hundreds of thousands of predictions across the decades, which it does, again, in areas like fossil fuel exploration. Oh, really? Um... One of the arguments that King has made throughout this debate is that the zircons in which Gentry found the samples in, do keep in mind that when I worked for Gentry uh, in the early 70s, he taught me actually how to make these measurements. And so... I have actually, with my own eyes, looked down a microscope and seen a halo. And my goal, Gentry gave me, was to use grit to get right down to where the zircon was. And that gives you a true diameter. But what's my point? My opponent has argued that there are always cracks and somehow the radon gas gets in and some Come things. Minute left. That. One minute left. Thank you. But in my own observation, let me use another color, looking in biotites, which are silicates, phyllosilicates, in fluorites from pegmatites around the world, when I actually did this all those nights that I worked for him part-time. I saw no cracks coming through. When I did my sections and when he did his sections, which are part of this 1974 paper that I've referred to, he didn't use uranium halos or polonium halos near cracks. And so that counter argument is simply not true, King. Back to you, moderators. So he took a little bit to say it, but his point was there are no micro fractures because I have seen radio halos and I did not see micro fractures when looking under a microscope. Now, remember, we're often using microscopes that are of industrial grade, a thousand times magnification. And even then, differences are difficult to discern, at least between polonium decaying into polonium and radon decaying into polonium. But there is actually something greater at play here. So microfractures generally form under stress, which means the conditions under which these rocks are forming are very important with regard to whether or not we predict microfractures or a sort of smoother rock. For instance, crystals that form during the magma stage tend to not microfracture, probably due to the heat and pressure at their time of formation. These conditions that lend themselves to a lack of microfractures should be pretty well understood by someone who has a master's in geology. 
so I don't know why they aren't appreciated here by McQueen. At long last, we finally finish McQueen's rebuttal section, and we begin to segue into the open discussion after McQueen gets to go have a five-minute break. Uh, uh, Mr. McQueen, you uh, you did uh, get your break in. You are good to go for the rest of the debate. Is that correct? Well, uh, ordinarily, Donnie allows me to take a break at the one-hour mark, so I'm good until uh, I notice we've been on now about 50 minutes. Can we go another 10? What we can do oh, okay. is, is right after the discussion, the 40 minutes that we could start now, um, we can do a, 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 a bit of a break there if you needed a bathroom break or anything like that. Yeah, please. Uh, if you would drop my video, I'll go get some hot tea and be right back. Which I'm going to do myself. I'm going to take a sleep for about eight hours and I'll see you when I return bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. It's actually a few days later because I needed a minute to recover from the video thus far, but in the spirit of things, I am still wearing a type of muscle shirt. So while McQueen is getting his tea, Casey sets up another presentation to bring up some examples from the beginnings of the opening discussion, and his opening kind of comments before McQueen returns really exemplify some of the thoughts and some of the moods that I was feeling after hearing McQueen's rebuttal boiled down to it's all conspiracy. David and I will talk and I'll, I'll offer some of my opinions as a professional scientist, as one who is currently working in science, uh, on some of the things I do and appreciate about implications of, of conspiracies. So that's, that'll be, I think, the first topic of discussion. As it should be, I think. McQueen's response to why do all the radiometric dates seem to corroborate and hone in on a singular idea of an ancient Earth 4.5 to 4.8 billion years of age, and why do they seem to match across different methods within radiometric dating and also external to radiometric dating, these independent methods like ice cores, dendrochronology, thermoluminescence, and the movements of the continents. And his response is just, yeah, it's too good, must be conspiracy. So I do agree with KC here that the first order of business should be, on what basis does he place the idea that there is some cabal of radiometric daters around a thousand people across the world, all together uniting in this nefarious idea of showing that the Earth is very ancient and that this idea is also useful to the fossil fuel industries and indeed many others. Why does he actually think this? Surely it's not just a, a faith claim, right? Queen shows back up to deliver news of a devastating event. I have some sad news. My coffee machine broke, um, but uh, we can go on. I thought he was getting tea. So David, you, uh, mentioned that there were some things that you as, as a scientist didn't appreciate, me saying that there was some silliness going on in creationist accounts of how the world works. Uh, one thing that I also as a professional working scientist don't appreciate is the suggestion of conspiracies taking place without the supplying of evidence to support this. Because believe it or not, this is actually a question that can be addressed. So it seems to me that your suggestion, and you can correct me on this if I'm mistaken, is that this cult of 200 or so people in the world who do the radiometric dating, um, they massage the data in such a fashion as to produce cr cross confirmations of the sort that you see on the tables in front of you. Is that correct? Do you, sir, believe that there is a cabal of around a thousand people worldwide across nation lines, all working together towards the singular goal of making sure that their radiometric dates corroborate one another, and that there is also seemingly no email evidence of this whatsoever. It's a simple yes or no question, right? Do you believe that or do you not? Well, let's look at it this way, my friend. All of these people have jobs that in the American context are above minimum wage. Yes, he takes almost four minutes to say yes. However, there is key information added in the Queen's response here. He doesn't actually think that these individuals in the cabal are a part of a cabal in the sense that they communicate with one another. He simply thinks that each individual is operating under an evolutionary paradigm that they assume, and then they make a guess on what the radiometric dates would be if evolution was correct. Now, yes, I know evolution in the age of the Earth have very little to do with one another methodologically. That doesn't matter. McQueen pairs them, most young Earth creationists do. Now, the question here then, of course, is 
why did the guesses also match up? Like, if there's no objective criteria that exists as a basis for assigning ages to rocks, why are individuals coming to similar ages at all if they're not communicating? I feel like realistically, it has to either be a genuine conspiracy where all of these individual agents are communicating across this network of evil to make sure that their dates cross-corroborate one another, or it's just a really big coincidence that these guys are guessing the same dates. But I would suggest to you that um, these are the reasons that certain young universe, young earth dates are rejected is because they, they'd lose their job. They'd lose their job within a month. So it's not a top-down conspiracy with some shady individuals sitting in a volcano barking orders at these labs. It's 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 more oh, of a no, bottom no, up. It's, it's, it's a bottom up thing from perverse incentive structures, is what you're saying. Yeah. As a response to this characterization, David McQueen goes on a tangent about how he doesn't think KC should categorize himself as an atheist. Instead, he should be an agnostic because he doesn't think Casey has turned over every rock in the universe and thus can't say there is no God, to the point at which Donnie has to actually step in and drive the conversation back on topic. Yes, the same Donnie that put McQueen up to this debate in the first place has to corral his man into talking about the subject he came to speak about. I'm just going to jump in here, uh, David McQueen. I, I want to make sure we're fully utilizing the 40-minute period. So as interesting as a debate would be on atheism versus ag agnosticism and and other um, you know issues, let's really focus on radiometric dating. Casey, okay. if you'd like to respond to any of that, go ahead, and then we'll allow uh, David to pick the next uh, okay, question. Okay, I've got some topic. other things here. And don't think I didn't see a couple of you guys hanging out in the Modern Day Debates comment section complimenting Donnie for his excellent unbiased moderation. I don't think that this particular instance was Donnie trying to be a good moderator. I think he saw the writing on the wall and he knew this was making McQueen look bad. The entire side chat was like, what are we talking about? I thought this was on radiometric dating. So, you know, but I am a pessimist on Donnie's motivations these days. Okay, go ahead, uh, Casey. Okay. Well, if David is correct, and for example, these tables by uh, Dalrymple don't include all the data he collected because he arbitrarily excluded dates that didn't conform to his expectations, then we should be able to find statistical residue left over from that decision. Uh, so I'm going to give you an early Christmas present right now, David, and I'm going to show you how you can actually go about exposing um, the kind of fraud that you're suggesting is taking place. I appreciate. I'm surprised you would even acknowledge Christmas as an atheist, but go ahead. To be perfectly candid, what Casey did in preparation for this next part to respond to McQueen's conspiracy claims is absolutely impeccable as far as foresight goes. I guess he knew ahead of time that McQueen was going to bring the conspiracy up or he had some kind of inkling that it would maybe come up. So what Casey did was run a statistical test using a handful of papers to see if there was some kind of selective bias in reporting. He just did a preliminary test of McQueen's hypothesis of conspiracy and then presented it to him. So what I did was I generated a funnel plot of the standard errors for the measured KT deposit tectide ages against their mean values, along with the results of a, of a regression test to determine the extent to which this plot is asymmetrical. Uh, and as you can see, P is greater than 0.05, so the funnel plot is symmetrical and the test does not provide evidence for the selective reporting of outcomes. Um, if there was selective reporting of outcomes, at least within that data set, what we would expect to see is that there is a non-negligible relationship between the effect size that they want to get and the standard error associated with that effect size. The effect size in this case just being the, the means, the mean ages that they calculated. Um, so I did the same thing with the data involving the chondrites, and once again, there's, there's no evidence of publication bias. This physically hurt me on behalf of McQueen, but mostly Donnie. I don't think McQueen fully comprehended what Casey was saying, at least at this point in time. But, oh gosh, ah, oh, that's gotta hurt. That's gotta sting. That someone took your conspiracy idea that you may have specifically posited because it's so nebulous and difficult to test, and then just tested it for you and showed that it was BS. Bravo, Casey. Love that. Love that for you.
Now, I actually edited and put the figure in that last clip because when Casey was first explaining this, evidently his screen wasn't shared. And once it finally did get shared, we get this from Donnie. We know. Oh, it's it's I finally see it. There. It's back up now. Yeah, there you go. It looks like it's up now. It looks like it's up now. It sounds so despair filled from Donnie. That's gotta suck. Donnie's carted out McQueen onto this debate stage and McQueen goes, ah, have you considered conspiracy? And KC goes, yes. I've been statistic to death in my life from my Tennessee days. So I do understand what you're saying. Go ahead. Um, but the best part though, Dave, is you can do this without ever setting foot outside of your house. All you need yeah. is access to the internet, which you seem to have, um, some yeah. open source statistical software, and a means of accessing publications. Boom, yeah. you're set. Yeah, I'm sure he'll get right on that, KC, right after he figures out the math for solving the heat problem, baby. Tube. Of course, now that you mention it, right, he doesn't need to solve the heat problem anymore. If it's conspiracy, then those radiometric dates don't actually show ancient ages, so he doesn't have to account for it. Yay! Oh, wait, no, now you got a conspiracy problem, huh, that you can't support. I'm aware that there's a new open source that is the letter R. I'm not sure I'd call R new, but sure, go go, go for R. It's a good oh, yeah. one. Certainly new for me. Um, okay, may I respond uh, uh, to this? Mm -hmm. um, of course, yeah. Uh, we want to make sure it's 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 free flowing. So yeah, right. To respond so, to each other. Oh, poor Donnie. Damage control, Donnie. Yep. Yeah, uh, we want to make sure it's 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 free flowing. Yeah, we want uh, we want. Please, David, say something. Answer him. You can't just let him show math and charts that prove us wrong and make us look silly. Let me uh, pull some data. Um, on a couple of different things. Uh, George Bond is a name I hope you're familiar with. Yeah, the random Australian that has been working with you for the past year unsuccessfully at coming up with the numbers that solve the heat problem, we know. The George and I uh, will continue to work all during the month of November on the mathematics of this. Uh, he pointed out to me that a 2018 post on physics.org um, made a, a very interesting argument against radiometric dating. The dilution of atomic carbon-14 by volcanic carbon made the dates for tree material from the Taupo eruption appear to be 40 to 300 years too old. Now, that's a small error there, but let's read what it is. Oh, there was an incorrect radiocarbon date due to introduced carbon, something that we know happens, and I've myself made a super long video on describing the many ways that this can happen via cosmic radiation or intrusion by groundwater. This is not groundbreaking, and I think McQueen knows it by the way he sheepishly adds, this is a small error. But more importantly, we could recognize that carbon was added, couldn't we? meaning there's a diagnostic means by which to assess material to find out whether or not there's been intrusion. And the last eruption is falsely put in the literature as 250 CE. That really should be BC to honor the true king, King Jesus. Uppercase K king, for those of you wondering. McQueen then goes on to ask Casey how he can make sense of this discordant date, and Casey responds by bringing up what he said earlier. But at, at the end of the day, even if, if you had no explanation for how any of this could happen, even, even, even if the dozen or so anomalies could not be explained, um, it would still be justified for the same reason mammography is still justified, uh, despite the fact that there are occasionally errors. But I'm not entirely sure what this has to do with my point concerning publication bias and Agra's regression test and funnel plots. I really liked this because Casey is not happy with the way that McQueen is trying to wriggle away from addressing the fact that his hypothesis of conspiracy 
simply doesn't fit with the data and needs to be kicked out. McQueen needs to face that question of how can you say there's conspiracy when the data shows there isn't? I guess here it would have been the cherry on top to say something along the lines of, yeah, carbon can be reintroduced. How do you suppose it is that they knew that this was reintroduced carbon in the first place? Could it be that we can tell when introduced carbon or introduced any material is present and thus can account for it when radiometrically dating samples? But also, I'm sure if Casey was watching me debate McQueen, he would have liked it if I had taken the time to do a full ass statistical test on whether or not there's a sampling bias or publishing bias in academia. Well, um, let me try to clarify it. Um, let me clarify it with another example. I'll just use another example. And he just proceeds on his merry way talking about another anecdote. Finally, Casey breaks in, thank God. I work for the United States Geological Survey and- I'm sorry, State David, could I, could, I, could I interrupt you really quick? I'm, I'm still not seeing what this has to do with publication bias, the, the accusation of, of publication bias um, for the geochronological literature. I visibly pumped my fist at this. I was like, thank you, don't let him get away with this. He needs to answer the question. Okay, well, let me go back. I thought I'd made this clear earlier. Um, let's see, how could I say this? In 1997... I will give the pain a 10. Um, I mean, go watch this for yourself. I'm not selectively editing this. He really does just keep doing this over and over and over again. It needs to be said, McQueen is not a very good debater. He's not very good at articulating his points. And he and his agnostic buddies made fun of Bishop Usher. They actually had a guy come in dressed as a bishop. But he does get to his point, and that is this. My argument is that these papers that Dalrymple put out in the 90s are selective data. In other words, right. you may have I get that point. I get that. But can we, can we share my screen again? Because I feel like my point's not being understood. Okay. And this is why I'm saying McQueen didn't understand the point earlier, because what he just argued is the entire thing KC statistically tested for. Selective reporting. Okay. Yeah. So, David, uh, let me let me simplify this really quick, uh, re re really broadly for you. Why is this plot, which is generated using the data from this table on the left over here, why is this plot symmetrical, and why is P greater than 0 0.05? If there is okay. publication me... bias taking place, if, if there is selective okay. reporting of data. Let me write this down on my whiteboard here. This is one of the roughest parts of the discussion, and I'm going to make you listen to all of it. So here we see KC trying to explain the statistical test that he performed, as well as the data set that he drew from, to David McQueen. Enjoy. And we'll talk about it. So the, can you make this big? What is the y-axis on this thing? The standard error. Okay, this is standard error. Mm -hmm. Okay. X axis is the so this mean, is the mean measured uh, ages in millions so of years. This is the mean a Gaussian distribution mean Poisson distribution. What kind of distribution? Um, these are normally distributed. Okay. These are from, the, from normally the X axis is what effect? The, what does that say? Effect size. So in in this context, that means the uh, mean ages. Okay. And so we've got this cone here, and right, the data the points, the, do, the data points have got a, uh, uh, are up here at the top. Now, are you saying that the data you've plotted there is from Dalrymple's data? Yes, this, is, this comes from the table on the left. Okay. Now, these are up here. Um, very close to predictions. But what about all these that are scattered all around here? Uh, they they don't have an R value that's statistically valid, valid do they? No, no, this, this, is, this is not a correlational plot. This, this is a funnel plot. The, 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 the regression test is not run on this plot. Um, okay, but so what, see, what are the numbers what, at the bottom? The numbers go from, what, 10 up to 80 or something? I can't read the bottom down, the x axis. The, the x axis goes from 62 to 68. Those are millions of years. 62 million years mm -hmm. to 68 million. Right. 
And what this plot is measuring is the relationship between the measured mean and the standard error, the, the standard deviation, quote-unquote, of, of these results. Now, we would expect, if there's publication bias, for there to be a non-trivial skew of these results in one direction or the other, or just, just wildly scattered all over the place. But what we see instead is, is a symmetrical distribution, which means that there isn't really a preference for uh, where they want their data to land. Um, the, the most precise measurements, um, which are the, the ones that are closest to the true effect size, um, these are converged upon uh, by all of the other data, including the, the less precise measurements. Um, whereas for a biased literature set, we would expect there to be a whole bunch of less precise measurements that are clustering around some preferred value. Um, and we can well, quantify that a... using the regression test. For... So, so what let I'm saying is a... you, can, you can apply this kind of test broadly throughout the literature to check for publication bias, but I've applied it specifically to this instance, and there is no evidence of it here. So I consider myself proficient in R. I understand statistics decently well, but I'm by no means an expert in it. And I felt he did an excellent job there explaining precisely what he did and what he was testing for. In response to this very succinct breakdown that Casey just provided for David McQueen, all while David McQueen was taking notes on his whiteboard, this is how he really responds. When I worked for the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, one of my co-workers was a... I just got bamboozled one thing. I'm... You can't make this up. So I edited down the anecdote and we finally get to hear McQueen's response to the work that King Crocoduck did. Now, what's my point? My point is, I choose to disagree with the data that uh, Dalrymple published in the mid-90s. Let's go on to our next uh, point, please. He disagrees with it. He just, he just disagrees with it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I just choose to disagree with the evidence that shows the Earth is a globe. Counter evidence? No, I just choose to disagree with it. Yeah, you know, I choose to disagree with the statistical work that shows that smoking is associated with certain types of respiratory cancers. Counter evidence? No, I, I choose to disagree with it. It's raining outside today? Well, I choose to disagree with that. Joking aside, this is a pathetic response. It's not really a response at all, is it? And KC, God bless him, just doesn't let this slide. But well, I'm, I'm not understanding why, though. Like, the, the claim that you made earlier, the suggestion you made, is that there's a conspiracy. Uh, it's not a top-down conspiracy. It's a bottom-up conspiracy, as we clarified. That's the result of perverse incentive structures. They suppose, Supposedly, they don't want to lose their jobs, so they're just throwing out yeah, that. Exactly. But exactly. but if but then if that were the case, we would see this plot here being skewed uh, in one direction or the other. It, it would not be symmetrical, and this p-value here would be less than 0.05. So what I'm saying here is that this analysis that I performed, uh, actually for both data sets, here's the one for the other one, um, these things do not show evidence of what you're saying to be the case. Well, uh, we're going to have to disagree on that because... I've actually been in lectures by Professor Dalrymple uh, at the 1997 uh, Geological Society of America annual meeting. I have heard him laugh at Bishop Usher. I've heard him laugh at the concept of a young earth. And so he himself is a biased researcher. I'd prefer to leave it at that. So to be abundantly clear, the reason why David McQueen chooses to disagree with Dalrymple's data is not because he has a problem with the methodology of the data. It's because Dalrymple laughed at young earth creationists. I mean, I just don't know what to say about that one. On one hand, it has really nothing to do with, again, the actual analysis performed by KC but also Dalrymple wasn't the only data set used by KC. What about that one, David? Okay, whatever. I, 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 guess, uh, I guess this is something we'll just have to put off to the side. I mean, I've thought about it a little bit, and I guess this is exactly what you would expect as a response from your average person. If you've held the belief for, you know, 40, 50 years, that's four to five decades, this idea that there's a conspiracy, and that's the reason why your ideas 
aren't gaining traction and the ideas of people that you seriously look up to. I think that when confronted with actual data, especially live like this, that just outright proves you wrong, that there isn't actually a bias. And maybe perhaps the problem was with your work and not who you were. That's going to cause someone to kind of shut down. The cognitive dissonance going on there is just going to cause a complete blackout, cognitively speaking. And that really sucks. I feel kind of bad for David McQueen. He has the shutters up. He cannot be reached even by data itself. It's just not going to make it past the sort of this sort of safe zone that he's set up for himself. I feel kind of worse for Donnie because it makes him look like a kind of a jackass for putting McQueen out here in the first place. And also because he's been really um, signal boosting McQueen and McQueen's ideas over on his channel for quite some time now. But this is something of a lesson, I think, for those of us who are science communicators and trying to communicate um, how to think critically and how to assess things like scientific papers. And that's that some people aren't going to be reachable. And it doesn't matter how much proof, quote unquote, uh, support for your idea is a better way of putting it. It doesn't matter how much of that you bring. They're not going to come over to your side because they can't afford to mentally. And I'm sure that Casey did not go into this thinking that he was going to convince David McQueen. Although much, I imagine, to David McQueen's chagrin were he to, to view something like this, I imagine that his performance is going to pull anyone on the fence who's viewing this over to the more not young earth creationist side of things. So they move on to a different topic and talk about the impact that radiation would have on basically all of the organisms of the earth if you were to accelerate nuclear decay in order to make sense of the old earth readings in a young earth context. Because if you accelerate all that nuclear decay, it has to happen very quickly and release a lot of radiation in a short amount of time. Now, the radiation problem is actually a different thing from the heat problem. Something that you will see is lost on McQueen, but he does bring up an argument that I want to address. Uh, during the last year, George Bond and I have been working on the physics associated with um, the mantle crust boundary. And so let me answer lowercase king here. So next, instead of actually talking about the radiation problem, McQueen is going to explain him and George, remember from earlier's current explanation for solving the heat problem. And he's going to use a whiteboard, so so will we. I would imagine you're afraid of losing your job should you use your real name on uh, this debate, but I'll, that's something to the one side. Another devastating roast by McQueen. Now, McQueen takes quite some time to explain his model and how it incorporates with Baumgartner, another Young Earth creationist model. So I'm going to explain it rather quickly here now. As we all know, tectonic plates move across the surface of Earth's mantle. Now, when two of these tectonic plates meet, one of them ends up being subducted or pushed underneath the other one. Over time, the subducted plate gets heated by the surrounding mantle and eventually ends up liquefying into molten rock. This is because the mantle is very, very hot. The coldest temperatures tend to be 1,000 degrees Celsius, and the higher temperatures creep close to 4,000 degrees Celsius. Back in the 90s, young earth creationist John Baumgartner pointed to the fact that some of these slabs, before they're entirely liquefied, are cooler than would be expected under normal evolutionary timescales and processes. He uses this to say, well, that means that they must have been subducted very recently indeed, instead of over the course of millions of years. McQueen has hijacked these cold slabs in order to try to solve the heat problem. As you know, if you want to cram all of the radiometric decay from 4.5 to 4.8 billion years into the single year of Noah's flood, which is what most young Earth creationists want to do, they call this process accelerated nuclear decay, and then add on to that the heat that is released from the rapid friction of the continents atop the mantle, since they need to get Pangaea and Rodinia, previous supercontinents, into their current formation during the single year of the flood, they need to get rid of all that heat because all of that heat is going to vaporize the granitic crust of the earth a few dozen times over, which would annihilate Noah's Ark and, of course, the entire planet. So to solve the heat problem, McQueen proposes this. He argues that the cold slabs and these cooler material blobs that they release in the mantle act as heat sinks 
for the intense amount of heat on the surface of the Earth and within the crust, thereby pulling the deadly heat from the surface of the Earth away from Noah's Ark and the rest of the planet and into the mantle instead. So as you can see in our little picture here, here's Noah's Ark, here's the crust of the Earth in blue and the mantle starting in red. The cold slabs are found within the mantle and they pull heat from the surface of the Earth and the atmosphere of the Earth into the mantle of the planet where it is safely sequestered away. And from the calculations we've done, King, uh, is that lowercase King capital? Uh, it's understood. Now let's assume for just a moment that Baumgartner is right and these cold slabs exist and are problematic. Can they exist as a heat sink to solve the heat problem? The answer is a vehement no, and the reason is very, very simple and has also been explained to McLean several times. Essentially, the problem is thus. The mantle of the Earth is very, very hot. It is 1,000 to 3,700 degrees Celsius, moving from sort of the outward portion of the mantle to the core. This means that in order for the mantle to act as a heat sink, including the cold slabs, which are not much colder than this, contrary to their name, I believe the coolest they get is 500 degrees Celsius. So we've got 500 degrees Celsius here to pull the heat from the surface of the Earth. According to the second law of thermodynamics, in order for this to act as a heat sink, right, the entire area that the heat is being pulled from has to actually be hotter than 500 degrees Celsius or else the heat will not flow into the system. Heat always flows from hot to cold. It's trying to reach equilibrium. This is the second law of thermodynamics. So actually, this is just still a heat problem, isn't it? But, but David, what does that have to do with the radiation problem? Oh, I'm, I'm coming to that. Just give me a minute here. Let me see if I actually have this reference here. Um, I don't have it quickly. What it has to do with the radiation problem is this. Uh, if these sort of blobs occurred during the year-long worldwide flood, they would then become uh, heat sinks. And so... Not only in these areas are there obviously a thermal rise, but if you look at the physics of it, these things can cut both ways. So in Baumgartner's catastrophic plate tectonics model, which has the plates moving not a few centimeters a year, but meters per hour, this is going to allow the heat generated in this area to be taken back down to the mantle. For those wondering, the specific map on this has at the time of Noah's Ark, the temperature of the Earth being 40,000 degrees Celsius if we start accelerating radioactive decay at Adam and Eve. If you don't, if you just do it beginning in the flood, this number becomes 70,000 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So the blobs model does not work because of the second law of thermodynamics. It's just not gonna happen and no amount of math unless you're changing the fundamental rules of physics is going to help. That's why George and McLean are gonna be working on that math for a little bit longer than a year. Moving on to those cold slabs because the question then remains, are the cold slabs actually problematic? Are they, as McQueen says, against evolutionary predictions and indicate that the Earth is quite young indeed? No, cold slabs aren't problematic for conventional science in an ancient time scale. Back in the 90s, cold slabs, as they are sometimes called, but as Baumgartner always refers to them as, were poorly understood, but today, and specifically there's a paper done here, as you can see in 2021, we understand them to the degree that we have like a nice dynamic model to explain precisely what is going on there. We also have more precise measurements. So let's talk about cold slabs, how they form, and what they mean for the conventional time scale. The paper here is Slab Temperature Evolution Over the Lifetime of a Subduction Zone by Holt and Condit, 2021. Cold slabs are associated with oceanic crust. In this graphic you can see here, which is a graphic designed by the authors of the paper, but used for a sort of press post. I think it's easier to understand, so I'm using this one, but I'll link the original paper in the description. Shows the oceanic crust being subducted underneath the overriding continental crust. It's being shoved underneath into the mantle underneath the continental crust. And critically, this is where the cold slabs are formed 
with the oceanic crust that is suffused with water. As the oceanic crust is subducted underneath the continental crust, the water begins to boil off. However, this has to happen relatively slowly over long geologic periods because it's a continental plate and there's a lot of water, like, you know, an ocean's worth. This results in a dynamic temperature gradient, as you can see here. We have 100 degrees Celsius before the subduction, then 300 degrees Celsius, 500 degrees Celsius, and very quickly into the 700, 900, and 1100 degrees Celsius. This is very hot indeed and not cold enough to act as a heat sink for your, um, for your, your heat problem solution, your blobs, if you're McQueen. Now notice that there's this nice blue line that travels down with the oceanic crust. This is the water, of course, being boiled off. And specifically, you can draw a rock from this area. You can sample rock from this area, and you will notice that you get this gradient of blue schist and eclogite. Blue schist is a rock that contains the mineral glaucophane, which forms under conditions that contain low temperature and high pressure, like those found at subduction zones. So cold slabs then are the result of hydrated minerals in oceanic crust when subducted, lowering the melting point of the rock and resulting in a much longer process for the phase change of solid rock transitioning into molten rock. And this model is supported by the fact that blue schist can be harvested from these ocean subduction zones. So wow, wouldn't you know it, there's a conventional explanation for the existence of cold slabs, a model whose predictions are met by the types of minerals found at the sites. So cold slabs aren't problematic and they can't act as a heat sink and McQueen is off topic, so let's let Casey interrupt and maybe drive us back in the right direction. I think there's some confusion here, David. I'm, I'm not asking for an account of where the, the thermal radiation went. I'm, I'm talking about the ionizing radiation. It's, it's, it's the ionizing radiation that I'm trying to refer to here. It's, it's the stuff that is flowing through the materials and is, that is going in every direction on Earth. Um, and is accelerated to to a substantially greater degree than than what's happening right now. Because if you, if you accelerate if you accelerate the decay rate, you're accelerating the flux of of um, ionizing radiation. And if you're accelerating the flux of ionizing radiation, especially to the to the degree that creationism requires, which is like on the order of hundreds of thousands uh, of, 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 of a factor of hundreds of thousands. Um, you are now delivering lethal doses of ionizing radiation, even without the temperature, right? You, you, you could do well, this without... I see, uh, I see, King, that you and I share some experiences. Uh, I uh, have over 20 graduate hours in toxicology and further training through OSHA. So I know exactly what you mean when you talk about LD50. Oh, good. Then McQueen should be able to understand precisely what the problem is. Let's hear how he's going to fix it. What I'm trying to suggest is that while George Bond and I do not have every answer, we're moving in a direction where this LD50 calculation that's been done by you and others is simply incorrect. Uh, there would not be that sort of dose. Um, oh, okay. We don't know how yet, but we do know that you're wrong and we'll prove it eventually. I like, too, how he says we don't have all the answers. You don't have any yet, McQueen. You and George have no math for your heat problem solution, and it breaks the laws of thermodynamics. And your answer to KC here, who laid it out quite plainly, is, ah, uh, ooh, <laughs> we'll get there eventually. I love what KC does next here, where he's talking about exactly who has come up with the calculations for this lethal dose of radiation. But, but David, it's it's not just me and you know others who agree with like the, the rape project, the, the the group of creationists who got together yes. and tried to address this. They themselves have acknowledged that the radiation problem uh, is unresolved and will continue to be unresolved until some exotic new physics are discovered. This is this is fatal not only to the people who are living on Earth and who get exposed to this ionizing radiation. This, this is fatal to creationism. Yes, and there he puts it quite clearly, right? That's the ball game. Until you're going to show up with these exotic solutions that the Ray Project heavily indicated would end up being miraculous, then it's game over for young Earth creationism. The, the radiation, the heat, none of it is going to be able to um, find its solution in conventional means. 
which means it's no longer science. And that's the entire goal of the young earth creationists at AIG and ICR. They want to say that we have proof for YEC and it's not just magic did it, right? It's scientific proof, but this is a silver bullet to that and they are not going to be able to find a way around it by their own admission, as Casey pointed out. Well, see, I beg to differ because of the work that uh, uh, George Bond and I have done. Again, what work? Where is the work, McQueen? Well, you, you sure would think that you would bring it to a discussion like this. All that fancy math that you guys have supposedly got squirreled away somewhere that you've been working on for a year. Perhaps one of the things that Donnie can do for me is to uh, post uh, on this debate uh, the reference to the two-hour discussion that George and I had, Donnie, about um, this whole issue of the LD50 being incorrect. Okay, it's hidden away in a two-hour stream on Donnie's channel. Interesting. The solution to the biggest problem in Young Earth creationism is hidden in a two-hour stream on a channel with less than 15,000 subscribers instead of being posted in Nature or Science or, God, even the Answers Research Journal. Wouldn't you think they'd like to hear about this, David, that you solved this problem? By the way, when, when I mentioned LD50, uh, I'm not saying that the dose of of the earth is going to be at LD50. It's actually going to be much higher than that. It's going to be probably closer to like LD99. Great. So the stream is irrelevant anyways, because they were working with the wrong assumption of the LD number. How will McQueen respond to the fact that he was working with the wrong assumptions and his work is entirely baseless on the radiation problem? Okay. What's your next point, my friend? Beautiful. Actually, what we could do, uh, gentlemen, with the last 12 minutes, King Crocodile, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you asked the last two questions, this one pertaining to the heat problem, more or less. Uh, uh, the radiation David, problem. The, the radiation problem. If we wanted to, we could have David now uh, pose you a question and engage sure. that for a little bit. Yeah, why not? McQueen goes on to ask his question, and he gives a completely anecdotal account by which he references finding radioactive uranium with no daughter lead products involved at all, where there presumably should be. My geology friend wrote a very long review on this entire discussion over on his website and combed the internet for references to find some kind of evidence that this has ever been found, uranium with no lead where there should be, and he found nothing, not even in Gentry's original work. So what is there to say about this other than... Um, so I'm not sure I really understand the objection. Is, is it, Just to clarify, are we saying that there is a deficit of lead where we would expect half of it to have been, uh, half of it to have decayed to lead? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so uh, to, to answer your question, um, uranium doesn't decay straight to lead. It decays into a bunch of other things on the way. I don't, I don't know what geological processes might be at work to, uh, to, to make it so that, you know, uh, l let's say we have some well-defined distribution, right, of what these elements should be. Yeah, right. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know what geological process might be in play um, to sort them in, in one way versus another uh, in order to produce these kinds of results. I, I would have to look into it more. Okay, well... Um, Perhaps we can debate again uh, after Christmas and come back to this. Um, yes, I'll, I'll look me, forward uh, to seeing your funnel plot analyses and see if yeah, you found any yeah. evidence of bias. I don't think McQueen is going to be running that statistical analysis, to be honest with you. With regard to this question, it's always hard when put on the spot with a very specific example. So usually my strategy is first, let's see the citation. So I make sure that the individual asking the question with this anomalous example actually has an anomalous example instead of one of those things where, look, we have this problem for evolution or the ancient age of the earth. And then you look into the paper and the problem is presented in the abstract and then solved in the body of the paper as if that was the point of it. So if I was KC here, I think my inclination would be to say, oh, really? You have this example of just uranium with no lead in the product? Show me this, this citation. Um, and I, of course, I'm asking for that now because I can't check McQueen. No one has been able to find this example of uranium only. I think KC did really well for On the Spot by basically proposing a plausible reason. 
Uh, but it would have been nice, I guess, to just see him say, and also, where's your citation? I'm being really nitpicky, though. I think Casey is killing it in this conversation, obviously. McQueen finishes by asking another geology-specific question. This time, he's talking about some of the work that Gentry has done. According to my understanding, it's pretty easily answered by intrusions, but I'm not really sure what McQueen was asking, to be quite honest, and neither was KC. They went back and forth for a minute, and McQueen took like five minutes to explain something before ending with... But we want to turn this into a geology lesson here. Let's go on. And there's like one minute left, so they move on to closing statements, which I'll play for you now. Edited down, though, to the primary points. Cool, so I'm just, I'm just going to quickly reiterate the basic points. Um... First of all, decay rates are indeed derivable from fundamental physics. You know, once once you model, the better you model these things from fundamental physics, um, the closer you get to the experimentally observed values. And I think that this fact is devastating to creationism because now you're not just at war with geochronology, you're also at war with quantum mechanics. Second, the cross-confirmation. The point is, if, if, if you want to check for publication bias, uh, the tools are available to you. You can check for them. Based on the analyses that I've done so far, um, it doesn't look to be the case that there's publication bias, so I'm not sure that the suggestion of bias and conspiracy hold up, given given this information. I, here, here, here are some results from Bouvier et al. from 10 years later, and they, they match the ones from, um, from 15 years prior. So it's table one on the right. You've got uh, four and a half billion years. That's, that's the age that you get using all of these different methods. And then using a completely different method using uh, lead lead dating you know he gets the same results and it's not just like one measurement you can see there's there and then finally um the philosophical point like you can you can gesture to individual anomalies you can point to details here or there where something doesn't appear to make a great deal of sense and where you have to continue to do more reading and more digging into it until you see oh okay there's a plausible explanation um the point is if, if you're going to suggest a kind of revolutionary overthrow of the existing science um, you know, pointing to individual anomalies here and there, it's, it's just not going to cut it. You have to do better than that. I think that was a great way to round things off, retouching on all of the initial points and showing how they hadn't been addressed. And then we hear McQueen's finale. Good. I want to take the first minute to talk about some of uh, uh, King's misunderstandings. McQueen brings up reference 16 in Gentry's book again, and I'm not sure why he's bringing this up. It's that same thing where he's grappling with cross-contamination instead of actual decay rates, which was Casey's original point. You will find that under creationist assumptions, uh, there is no proof at all that uh, the decay rate has been constant. The second point that he makes about... Um, the issue of uh, consistency from one person to another. And I, am, I must admit, King, I am going to look up that reference that you gave for the person that went back to apparently Dalrymple's data and uh, confirmed it independently for four and a half billion years. That's good that he's going to look into it. Wonder what his conclusion is going to be. Now I want to go into a different way of uh, of argument, and that is the philosophical way. Uh, my point bears on this whole issue of mammography. Keep in mind that although there are problems with the uh, mammography and the interpretation of the X-rays, there are women that really do have breast cancer, and there are women that never have had it. Yes, and creationists also accept radiometric decay. They accept that this happens. They even accept radioactive decay rates to work for carbon dating when it has to do with confirming artifacts that are found in the Bible. So this doesn't work. He talks about how KC isn't actually an atheist, but is instead an agnostic. Claiming to be an atheist is just foolish. Uh, he hasn't turned over every rock in the universe. He has no idea that God might be hiding behind Jupiter right now. He doesn't know that. So he's an agnostic. He's not a, uh, uh, a, uh, an atheist. He talks about the archaeological evidence from the Bible and why he feels that that should provide evidence for trusting the Bible, reasons to trust the Bible. Again, seemingly forgetting the role that carbon dating plays in 
like affirming the legitimacy of certain events that happened. But going back to the point of this argument, uh, I'm concerned that uh, King and other old earth evolutionists that are agnostics are missing the evidence that our world uh, gives. President Ronald Reagan had a one-liner that was pretty good. He said, uh, he once brought, thank you. He once brought in a bunch of atheists to eat a fabulous meal at the White House. And after they had finished the meal, he said, well, I hear you all are atheists. So he went out to the Rose Garden. And when he brought them back in, he said, when you ate that meal, was there a cook, you think? Oh, yeah, there had to be a cook. When you see the beauty of nature, there has to be a loving God. Awesome. We finish with a look at the trees argument. Anyways, then they go on to the Q&A. And while I'm not going to go through every question, there are a few questions and answers of note, both from excellent performances with KC and with performances by McQueen. The people at Apple are reliable when it comes to talking about the date that a cell phone was made, just as the Bible is reliable in talking about the age of the earth being 6,000 years old. Remember that the age of the earth isn't actually something the Bible specifically and explicitly touches on. Instead, that 6,000 year date we get from Bishop Usher, a man, a human guy, a fellow who is fallible, who just kind of counted up the ages of the patriarchs to get it. So let's not confuse the Bible with a dude's hot take. Next question comes in from Creationist Crybaby. $5 super chat. Thank you so much for supporting this channel. So the question is for you, Professor David McQueen. The rates of seafloor spreading are made using GPS measurements. Why do the GPS rates agree with estimates of rates based on radioisotopes? This is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that we were talking about earlier. What will McQueen say? Crybaby, you and I have spoken in the past, and you uh, are incorrect in what you say. This was very intriguing. How is it possible that this could be incorrect, I thought to myself. And then McQueen goes on to cite a scientist. Well, one of the scientists there, and this would have been, I guess, 1980, uh, was named Lohman, Paul Lohman. L-O-W-M-A-N. McQueen references Lohman's work from the 70s and 80s and suggests that Lohman, a guy who worked at NASA, evidently came out against this idea of plate tectonics, at least with regard to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I thought this is very fascinating. I wonder if I can find anything by him. And of course, there's always a paper trail. So Paul Lohman is a real guy, and one of the first things I found about him with relation to plate tectonics and continental drift was in this little periodical in Science and Technology, uh, which is titled The Challenge to Continental Drift. So this sounds right, and it references a publication by Lohman from 1983. And they go on to say, they talk about Alfred Wagner, and then they say, the congruent coastlines separated by the Atlantic Ocean are the strongest evidence for continental drift. Yet, Lohman points out that when the east coast of North and South America is fitted together with the west coast of Eurasia and Africa, there's no room for a large chunk of southern Mexico. Similarly, the Arctic Ocean coastlines of Canada and the Soviet Union, that should give you a hint at the time period this was published, should mesh but do not. And if all the continents have been moving away from one another, the Earth should have expanded over the last few hundred million years. In fact, it has, but not by enough to accommodate the movements in the quote-unquote drift theory. How, then, can the continents remain stationary if the sea floor spreads? Lohman asserts that the shifting oceanic plates should be pushed under the continents rather than against them. The continents appear to mesh, he adds, because the sediment from the Earth's mid-Atlantic upthrusting mantle is distributed symmetrically on the coastlines by ocean tides. Lohman concedes that few of his fellow geologists share his views, but soon there will be nothing to debate at all. Within the next 10 years, sophisticated NASA telescopes now in orbit around the Earth will determine whether the continents really are moving for closing any incipient rift in the community of geologists. And it turned out that periodical from 1983 um, would have some interesting foresight. 
In this article from 2011 titled Remembering Paul Lohman because Paul Lohman passed away in 2010, it notes that Paul Lohman was actually pivotal in developing land satellite technology. Um, he helped manage some of the early Landsat research and co-authored Mission to Earth, Landsat, Use the World, and Planetary Landforms chapter of Geomorphology from Space. Dr. Lohman created one of the earliest maps using Landsat 1 data, and he authored a 1999 photogrammetric engineering and remote sensing journal article titled Landsat and Apollo the Forgotten Journey. So I saw this and I thought, well, oh boy, that sure is fascinating. It sounds like Paul Lohman, if anybody, should have been the guy to come around to plate tectonics. And so I did some digging to see what Paul Lohman thought about plate tectonics and the spreading at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, at least after that original uh, periodical from 1983. Did he change his mind? In this article titled Global Tectonic and Volcanic Activity of the Last One Million Years by Paul D. Lohman from the year 1997 in April, we see Paul coming around to plate tectonics in full. He notes, Plate motion and rigidity have been directly measured in many areas by space geodesy, specifically satellite laser ranging and very long baseline infro interferometry, and more recently by GPS, the Global Positioning System. The primary phenomena of plate tectonics, seafloor spreading and subduction, have thus been demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt for various plates making up the Pacific Ocean. Directly measured plate motions have proven surprisingly close to those inferred from the spacing of marine magnetic anomalies, covering around 3 million years. The space geodesy data will be shown in future editions of this map. However, the spreading rates calculated by Minster and Jordan in 1978 are retained in this one. So, Mr. McQueen, it looks like the guy you're citing disagrees with his past self and indeed was actually vitally important to the proof you're using him to try to debunk. He was one of the guys who was important in land satellite mapping, so using those actual real spreading rates of the continents. He proved the point you're trying to use him to debunk later on in his life. Yikes. And to be abundantly clear, like McQueen just thinks that the tectonic plates aren't moving anymore. And that's not even what Paul Lohman thought back in the 1980s. He thought that they moved just primarily at these uh, seafloor spreading locations in the ocean. He just thought continental plates didn't move or at least didn't move as much. There, There is evidence that in the past the continents have separated, but there's not evidence that in our modern world, they continue to separate in the zone between the Mid-Atlantic and Iceland. And that's just wholesale ridiculous. I don't think that you can hold the opinion that the continents aren't currently moving when we have GPS like stationed in the bedrock of all the continents and document them moving every single year. Not just NASA is doing this, right? Other organizations associated with geology and meteorology are also involved because it turns out understanding how the continents move is really important. Why does McQueen think earthquakes happen? They talk about polystrate fossils. That question is posed to both of the interlocutors. KC notes that he's done extensive research on this in the past and typically polystrate trees, which is to say trees that are upright, fossilized upright, seemingly as if they were buried rapidly by a single global flood. Casey points out that these are almost always seasonal and that they tend to only like go up through a single layer. Then McQueen counters by saying, no, uh, I've seen polystrate fossils that go through multiple layers. And to that I say, it doesn't matter whether it goes through one layer or multiple layers. I think that it is possible that McQueen has seen polystrate fossils go through multiple layers, but the problem is polystrate trees almost always have regenerative growth, which suggests that after a tree is partially buried by a localized flood, it recovers and certain aspects of the trees, usually of the root systems or the branches, continue to try and grow up and regenerate the tree and still keep it alive. Then typically it's another seasonal flood, either within the same season or the following season, comes along and buries it the rest of the way. Riddle me this, Mr. McQueen. How do you get a polystrate tree with regenerative growth if it was buried during a single global flood? How is it going to continue to try to grow upward and in some cases even reach into the layer directly above it? 
The next question, which is posed at KC, is how do we know that when radiometric decay is happening, that we start with all parent and no daughter? We touched a little bit on this earlier, but KC takes a different approach, and he starts talking about the nature of physics and how this relates to uranium and lead. McQueen then breaks in to start talking about how uniformitarianism is dumb and stupid, and then KC has to say, no, we're not talking about that, we're talking about something else. I cut out, obviously, a huge portion of McQueen's kind of anecdote here, so if you want to see what all he had to say about uniformitarianism, you can go to the original video. Gotcha. Okay, from Samir Farsane for $5, they say uh, to uh, King Crocodile, how can you prove that daughter elements, like lead and uranium, weren't already present in samples uh, who, when it formed, you can either deny or confirm? Yeah, so... Um... Looking specifically again at the case of, of uranium and lead, um, the formation of zircon crystals are, uh, they're, they're based on condensed matter physics. And if you look at the math for that specific case, there, there are only certain allowed elements, um, certain allowed energy thresholds that have to be met in order for these crystalline structures to form. And in the case of uh, uranium lead dating with, with these zircon crystals, um, it's not possible for them to form using any conventional methods, at least that I'm aware of, um, that allows lead to be present inside of this crystal structure. So the only way the lead gets there, the only way lead becomes part of that structure, is if it's initially uranium and then it decays into lead. Well, the, the error that King is making is the error that Darwin and so many... Um, in the uh, 1800s made, they assumed that the present is the key to the past. I think David has misunderstood the problem here. Um, it's not merely that we think that there are these general large-scale uh, higher-order processes that, are, that have been the same uh, over time. Of course we know that's not true. Um, it's the laws of physics that remain constant over time. And in this case, condensed matter physics, which allow only for certain configurations of elements um, under certain conditions. And in the case of zircon crystals, you know, if, if you can identify a mechanism that allows a zircon crystal to form with lead already in it, I think you'll have the ghost of a point. But as far as I can tell, it's just not physically possible. Does David know about the 1997 dating of Mount Vesuvius Igneous Rock? It was argon to argon dating. And the test results showed an age of 1,925 years. Since it was 1997, that was only off by seven years. The Vesuvius dating is notoriously difficult for young Earth creationists because we obviously have a historical record that tells us the exact year that this thing happened. This is the paper I like to go with, Argon Argon Ages of the 8079 Eruption of Vesuvius, Italy. Um, and they note that Argon Argon dates of 1,925 plus or minus 66 years was gleaned in 2004. They note this is the calendar age of the eruption. Our results together with the work of Renee et al. in 1997 and Renee and Min in 1998, those are the two papers you usually see, and the 98 one is the one I cite most often, demonstrate the, vali the validity of the argon-argon method to reconstruct the recent erupted history of young active volcanoes. So yeah, this is this is gonna be an issue for, uh, for old McQueen and other young earth creationists. How do you think he deals with it? We know when Vesuvius blasted off. And so we have a historical date for um, the eruption of Vesuvius. So we know that from eyewitness accounts. King Crocoduck has accused me of some sort of global conspiracy, global um, cooperation among these 200 people that do radiometric dating. Uh, that's not what I think. And I, I hate to return to money. Isn't it strange how so many things revolve around money? And I'll, and I'll say it this way. Whoever got this date uh, being only nine years different? It was actually the calendar year, so, you know, exactly right. If they had not done that, they would have lost their job and their children would not go to college. They, they have to choose a date 
that matches the evolutionary bias. And so I reject that date because it's some 50-year-old guy who wants to still make his Mercedes-Benz payment and send his children to a good school like University of Tennessee. That's, that's my explanation. Yeah, so he thinks it's conspiracy, of course. Um, you know, this is interesting, right? This is, reasoning is very flawed because in McQueen's eyes, there's no actual real way to test radiometric dating like at all, unless he himself is physically doing it. Because otherwise he can always just say, well, that's the date they wanted to get. This is literally just they're lying every time he gets an answer that he doesn't want to hear or sees a data set that he doesn't want to see. There is no way to actually prove radiometric dating to someone like McQueen. Well, Dave, the good news is I provided you with a tool that would actually allow you to substantiate that claim with evidence instead of just telling stories. So you go ahead, you look up funnel plots, you look up Egger's regression test, you look up uh, Bayesian, robust Bayesian meta-analysis. That's really the gold standard, I think. Um, you go ahead and you use these tools and you expose those uh, yeah. dishonest geologists. In uh, January or February, when we have another debate, my friend, uh, I will have looked into those methods and uh, we'll talk more okay. then. So Incidentally, I, I, have, I actually want to uh, just... just uh, bounce off that question a little bit. Uh, Dave, what about your uh, lifestyle? What about the payments that you've received from the Institute of Creation Research, Answers in Genesis, whatever other organizations you've been affiliated with? Couldn't a person make the exact same accusation against you? Well, ha, let me write some numbers <laughs> up on the board. McQueen's counter to this is nope. I was too poor when I was writing for these creationist organizations. Since they weren't paying me very much, it doesn't actually count. And Casey's response is to basically say, how much do you think people who radiometrically tape things are paid? And that just kind of hangs in the air. I do love that as a counterpoint, though. I think that that was hilarious of Casey to turn that around on McQueen and say, OK, like, why should we trust you? You get paid. Everybody gets paid for the work that they do in an ideal world. So why should we trust your sources over anybody else's? And McQueen's reasoning can be boiled down to, well, we weren't paid enough to lie. But it's a super chat, so we'll get it in here from Coffee Mom. Coffee Mom says, Darwin found evolution, but we didn't stop there. I think it's a very important point that uh, King is missing. The Darwinian viewpoint led, as the years went on, to the idea that came out in the 1920s in the European school system, uh, all over Europe, but I'll use Germany as an example. Here we in go. Yeah, I groaned right along with Casey there. That's a classic move to just say, you know how we can make evolution and natural selection, just normal biological things look bad? If we just put Hitler right next to them and say Hitler liked Darwinism, which, you know, no, but also your history is wrong. David, the Nazis didn't kill Jews because they thought that they were less evolved than them. The Nazis killed Jews because they thought they were evil. They had, they had a conspiracy theory uh, that held that Jewish finance and Jewish communism were conspiring with each other to secretly take over the world. Um, regardless of whatever eugenics beliefs they, they had, um, they would have still carried out the Holocaust, even if they thought, uh, you know, even, even if they didn't have, uh, you know, this, this, this perversion of, of evolutionary theory. It wasn't even really evolutionary theory. Uh, they believed in a lot of crazy BS. You, you, you have Hyperborean nonsense about uh, these ancient Nordic civilizations living under the ice or whatever, whatever you, you have, you have these occultist beliefs and, you know, we can, I, I can play this game too. I can point to the former Soviet union uh, and how their rejection of genetics um, and their rejection of evolutionary theory as it stood at the time uh, led to Lysenkoism whose implementation caused the deaths of millions. Oh yeah. So we can, well, we can, I, we can I play this. I can play this game too, David, is what I'm saying. And my well, history will be better because I'm not going to mistake Weimar Germany 
for Nazi Germany, the Weimar no. Germany being in the 1920s and, and, and Nazi Germany yeah. being in the 30s. Evidently, historians are kind of split on Darwin's influence on the Nazis. And this is mainly because they did advance eugenics, but they also did dip heavily into the occult and magic and psychic powers and things like that. So what I will say here is that <laughs> I did think it was pretty funny that Casey pointed out that you know, McQueen goofed up the 20s and the 30s there, especially because like my history is not very good and I caught that one. But it also deserves to be mentioned that common descent and evolution by natural selection are not the same thing as social Darwinism and eugenics. I would sincerely hope that anybody dating to talk about evolution as much as McQueen does would understand the difference there, although I know he doesn't. No, you're clearly making a mistake. Have you read Mein Kampf either in German or English? Have you actually read what Hitler wrote? I've read parts of it. He's not a great writer. No, no, it's a, it's like a punishment of hell to try to get through it. But if you go to his actual words, you come with a different, and you know. Does he mention Darwin? Does he mention again? Darwin even once in Mein Kampf? This is a question I actually know the answer to. Um, he doesn't know. Well, I, I have to pause on that. I think he mentions more the idea of eugenics and Spencer and people like that. Does he even mention Darwin once? No. Thankfully, Donnie comes in in a panicked state to stop McQueen from making himself look even worse, and thus Donnie by proxy. Uh, guys, appreciate the, the back and forth there. Maybe we should move on to the next yeah. question. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, two more super chats came in from TLO for five dollars. They say, just FYI, the Mount Vesuvius dating test and results are available online for free. Did David read slash look at those before saying it was a big conspiracy? Question mark. Okay, I would uh, like for you to send that either to Kaz or to uh, Donnie, and I will take a look at those results. He hadn't read the paper. He just didn't. He didn't read it. He just knew it was going to be a conspiracy because they all have to be conspiracies in order for him to stay a young earth creationist. Ah. But I don't, uh, in order for my argument to stand, I don't actually need to see the results. What a nice safe little box McQueen has painted himself into here, right? There is no data. There is no paper. There is no proof that he can see that would ever even move him a bit from his young earth creationist position he has made sure of it anything is either a conspiracy it is wrong or he hasn't read it and never will there are a few more questions before everyone kind of starts to draw to a close and take their leave and the discussion is over I think it's pretty clear that Casey, um, I'm going to go with ruined here. He ruined McQueen. And the reason I say ruined is because this is not something that McQueen can come back from. The fact that his response to the majority of Casey's points was it's a conspiracy, even though Casey came with statistical tests to show that it was not in fact a conspiracy, is very telling indeed. More telling is the fact that, to my knowledge, McQueen has not been on Standing for Truth's channel since this debate. I think Donnie is painfully, woefully aware of just how badly that went. KC was dangerously well prepared for this conversation with the statistical tests, yes, but he's also got quite a bit of experience with Young Earth creationism, and so he knew quite a few of the rebuttals to discordant dates and things of that nature off the top of his head. I think that he kept his cool quite well when confronted with questions that he didn't know the answer to right off the top of his head. And in comparison, uh, McQueen floundered a lot. And when in doubt, again, he just resorted to, well, it's conspiracy. They do it for the money. Oh, but they don't communicate with one another. It's just a coincidence that the dates match up. Add on to the fact that McQueen is not a very good speaker. He speaks in a very slow fashion. He takes a lot of detours and goes on a lot of anecdotes and is not very good at keeping his points succinct, 
which also makes him come across as a worse debater, as it were, as compared to KC, who keeps things on topic and rather laser focused. All of these things put together, along with the rather snide attitude that I feel McQueen has towards KC, as in, you know, he's already made his mind up, he knows that he's right, and he doesn't seem very willing at all to hear what his opponent has to say, which like, why have the conversation then? If you know, you're hoping to pull people over, you're not going to do that with a, it's all a conspiracy stance. This was very painful for me to get through. I listened to this entire debate a total of three times, once while I was at the gym, once while I was splitting up the clips for this video, and then once again while I was editing in my own responses. And um, it is very rough to listen to. I actually think the way that I've cut it up is the easiest way to consume it. Although yes, I did cut out bits of uh, McQueen and Casey's responses to one another just for the sake of brevity. It's an unfair matchup. I think everyone can appreciate that at this point. I don't think McQueen was well prepared, but then I don't know how he would prepare for something like this. He's already wrong and there's not enough math in the world that he can do to change the foundations of physics. Although I do think eventually young earth creationism is going to have to come to terms with the fact that they don't have an answer to this heat problem, to this radiation issue, and they're going to have to chalk it up to a miracle or go McQueen's route and say it's conspiracy. In that way, I guess it's good that we got a little look into the future, huh? Well, my gentle and of course very modern apes, I don't really think there's much else to say. And so I do hope you guys take care of yourselves and please go give Casey some love over on his channel. Subscribe to him if you haven't already. I'm looking forward very much so to content coming out um, from his way very soon.